I'd never been invited back a second time anywhere, so <laughs> this, is really, this is really awkward. <laughs> Great to see you today. How about that weather out there? This is very nice. And our, uh, our Steelers did well last night, right? Uh-huh. See, I said our. Yeah, yeah. I have a Cleveland Browns garbage can that's in my garage. That's okay. I mean, it's garbage. <laughs> so, it, it fits. Um, it's really remarkable to be here with you and appreciate very much uh, being considered as a role of your uh, pastor. Sarah and I are grateful for that possibility. Uh, love and greetings from our family uh, to you. Uh, our oldest is 25, and he is a, uh, teaches uh, visually impaired at a large school district. He's married to a gal who's a counselor, and they just had an offer accepted their first house just a couple days ago. So they're very excited, and they will be, they'll be in Phoenix forever. I'm pretty sure of that. Her whole family's there, and she's a twin. She's there, so they're going to be Phoenicians. Our next is a daughter, Emma. She's 23, 24, and she's a nurse downtown Phoenix, so she always has the fun stories. You, how many in the medical field here? Nurse? Yeah, okay. You nurses, man, you guys have stories. And you're not afraid to tell them. You guys scare me a little bit. And, uh, and I love it. Uh, she, being downtown Phoenix, from stab wounds to shootings, and she just comes home with all sorts of fascinating uh, stories for us. Um, if all goes well and as planned, you would meet her probably September 10th. She is just going to drive out here with me and then, um, then, then take off. She's worked out some time. Uh, they're doing great. Love the Lord. And then our youngest is still in the house. He's a, a junior at Grand Canyon University. And all goes well. He'll graduate in two years immediately as a second lieutenant in the Air Force. And he's working his way for chaplaincy. And so we're so proud of Ross. And so those are our three kids. And uh, none of them coming with us. I mentioned downstairs a few minutes ago, we may just give them a P.O. box. This is our big chance. And I may do a P.O. box like in Cannonsburg, just to throw them off a little bit. Um, and did I mention last time that my dad was born in Cannonsburg? I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, he, I, I, his birth certificate says Washington County, but he, um, his family, they're all from uh, Cannonsburg, which is pretty ironic, isn't it? Um, so, um, so anyway, I'm certainly grateful. Uh, many thanks to Mark and the team, the search team. Uh, Lori in the office has been very helpful. Augie, are you in here, Augie? Yeah, he's been so helpful. His financial expertise, thank you very much. You've been kind uh, sending me. His emails are always detailed and correct. That's what they always are. Whether you're in Phoenix at a... Uh, any size church or you're here in the Keystone State, there, is, there are some similarities between churches, and one of them is that Christianity can be perceived and can be very tiresome. It's another church service. It's another Bible study. It's another plea for volunteers, and it just keeps going, and no one knows this more than the search team. It's another meeting, and it's somebody else asking what's going on, and it's this constant, and it's exhausting. Christianity has worn out a lot of people. Unless we view it more with our text today as we view it more as what Christianity is to be led with. The main thing is our experiencing of God. If we experience who God is and we have that power, the, uh, the empowerment of pure experience with God that's 100% purely available through faith in Jesus Christ. So all the added things that are very good, 
but not the main thing. What do they say? The enemy of the best is the good. And so we do lots of things and our mind gets down into the things that we do. It's another program. It's another meeting to go to. And it's, I want to just take the day off. And it feels actually when it's to the point where missing a Sunday feels good. It's actually relaxing for you. It's that feeling is a great sign that we have lost the experiencing of God. We're called to give worth to Him. That's what worship means. It's to give worth to God. And whether we do it corporately on a Sunday or we do it on our own with our Bible in the morning, with the removal of sin through Jesus Christ, we have access to God to prize Him to show him worth. It's the Presbyterian catechism question number one, the famous, what is the chief end of man? What is it? Anyone, any, anyone go through catechism as a youngster? You're afraid to say it because I'm, you're going to be expected to answer. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The chief end of man is not to attend another church service. The chief end of man is not to be worn out by service and no one else is volunteering, so I'm just going to go ahead and volunteer for that too. And it's the weight and it becomes tiresome because that's not ever what's been intended. What's intended is through faith in Jesus Christ, we have access to our Heavenly Father and we get to go to Him and experience Him to glorify God and then to enjoy Him forever. The passage is Isaiah 6. If you have a Bible, you could turn to Isaiah 6. It's to experience God, the worship of God, the reverence of Him. Father, as we're flipping pages and thinking about You and our association with You, I'm asking that your Holy Spirit would give us wisdom and a challenge today to walk very closely to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a, your Bible there with Isaiah 6, you're going to want to glance at this passage. It's immediately looked at and seen as a bit out of place. You have Isaiah 6. And it's kind of the introduction to the call of Isaiah. Well, normally, a call of a prophet would be chapter 1. Well, this is later on. This is in chapter 6. The text says that it was in the year that King Uzziah died. That's important because they've had 52 years of great prosperity. Things have been going really good. Now, Isaiah or Uzziah is gone, and the clouds are starting to move in. Everything was so good, it's not quite so good anymore. A lot of uncertainty. Division is setting in. Complaining is setting in. There's a loss of vision and purpose. In the year that King Uzziah died, verse 1 of chapter 6, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And then verse 4, And the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. In this scene, we have the Lord seated on a throne, and there's debate of the throne of Uzziah, we just said that Uzziah king is gone. Is the Lord seated on his throne? Is it his own throne in heaven? Fortunately, context is not going to matter. High and exalted. 
The train of his robe, this scene with God seated in this robe that's filling the temple. And then verse 2, it's so fantastic, we have no idea, no one knows what a seraph is. Seraph is one of those words that you make up. What you do is you take a word in a different language, and when you just don't know what to say, you just take that word, foreign language, and you just put English letters to it. It's a serif. If you translated it, it's not like an official name. It actually is their fiery ones. That would be translation, fiery ones. It meant Isaiah's looking at this, and he has no idea what he's looking at. He goes, there's the, there's the Lord seated on a throne. In fact, I don't know if any of you would have noticed, maybe you did, and it says, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. Do you see that in your Bible? It's capital L, small O-R-D. But as you look on, like the end of verse 3, holy, holy is the Lord, all caps, L-O-R-D. It went from Adonai, which is a very distant and very generic name for God. It's the Lord seated. It's like God seated on a throne. And this scene, as Isaiah is staring at it, his robe fills the temple, and these fiery ones, that's what he calls it, these fiery ones are flying around the throne. And they, they can't be there. They actually don't belong there, which is why it says <clears throat> they cover their faces with their two wings, cover their faces with two their feet, and with two they're flying. They're covering themselves flying around the throne, and they're yelling, holy, holy, holy is the, and now it's all caps, it's Yahweh, it's His proper name. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And then the place shook. It says the doorpost and the place shook. Oh, because God's amazing on the throne? No, the place is shaking because of the fiery ones that are yelling out. This scene is so dramatic. This movement in Isaiah's eyes must have just been huge. And as we move in the text, we see they really were that big. He's like, this is, this is outrageous to me. There's so much happening. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty and the whole earth is full of His glory. That's what the fiery ones are saying. A common little Bible study point is it's the Trinity because you have holy, 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 so it's the three. Uh, that's not what it's saying. I, I, that's not the point. Um, you could probably draw that conclusion eventually. It's a triad. If you want to say something to the nth degree, you say th it three times. That's true in literature today. You could say it once, and you say it twice, you've said it twice. If you say it three times, it's to the nth degree. That's just linguistics. There's lots of threes. In fact, if you look at that in your Bible, especially in the Gospels, it's remarkable how many times three things are mentioned together because there's a completeness to it. Two doesn't have that. Three always has that. It's holy, holy, holy. It's holy to the nth degree is the Lord Almighty, and the whole earth is full of His glory. Think of the definition of holy. If you're thinking, and you're right, if you're thinking holy means without sin, holy means pure, true. But take a step above that. Holy means set apart. We're called to a holy life. That means, oh, I need to have a life without sin. Yes, but not the big point. That's part of it. That's one of many things. You're called to a holy life in Jesus Christ, which means you're to live a separate life. You and your college campus, you're different. You're going to have to be set apart. You're other. 
The otherness of God, it can be referred to, is holy. He's separate. He's different. Which, give the big list, uh, he's without sin. Yes, that's, that's true. He has purpose and he's driven. Yeah, you, you and I can describe all day long and we're doing it for you too because you're a part of a club or a group or your own family and you're set apart to be living a holy life. You're to be separate. You're to be other. You don't, you don't actually live to the beat of the world. You live to the beat of what God calls you to do. That's holiness. And as Isaiah was looking at this throne, and he's seeing this amazing setting, and these things that are flying, of which he has no idea what they are. They're just fiery. But they're fiery enough that they don't even feel like they belong because they're taking their wings and covering their feet and their face. And two, they're flying and they're going, holy, holy, holy. Like you have no idea how separate and how other God really is. You have no clue. We could beat that drum of he walks with me and talks with me. That's all true too. I get it. Yeah, he is. He's your best friend. But be careful. He is also holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is just filled with his glory. Well, which is he? And the answer is yes, he's both. In the depths of theology, they refer to it as the imminence of God. That would be the, he's with me every day and he loves me and he holds me and he makes me feel great. And the transcendence of God, which is he is so far above and beyond and different, you can't even describe it. He's both. And bad theology focuses on one and not the other. You have to have both. This text is speaking of the transcendence the otherness, the he is so spectacular you have no idea. Well, now we get an idea of what we want to do on a Sunday. We're gathering here to celebrate and worship God. So the team, which did a nice job in and really for a long time, putting things together and keeping things going. And the team sits down after somebody gets up to speak, and the team sits down and goes, we did it. How did we just do that again? How did that actually come together like the way we wanted it? Because it's amazing. You guys do a great job. But when we, and then when we evaluate, we say, okay, let's evaluate to see what we did and how we did it. It's excellent. They're doing that. That's why they do such a good job at it. The ultimate point of evaluation is, did we sense God? Did we worship? Now, being in the church business for a long time, I'm like, did the slides work right? AJ and I were just talking about that. Slides are so hard to do. They're so fun to make fun of when they mess it up. And you're like, can't you just push the button? For the one that thinks that needs to go try it, Because you need to be ahead of whatever's singing. And if you're singing, you actually mess up because you don't want to get involved because you get to stay ahead. It's hard. So we evaluate, okay, how were the slides and how was this? Did the transitions work okay? And we did, okay, good, we pulled off a good service. Yeah, kind of. Did we experience God? That's 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 the main point. Did we come and get a sense of God? There's a great old Scottish preacher that I, I read a lot of what he has said. He was in the 70s. And he, he's very particular about preaching. And he used to say, I will forgive a preacher of anything if they give me a sense of God. I don't care if grammatically it was incorrect. I don't care if he said things that were maybe not even fully correct. He did the best he could. But if you can give me a sense of God, that's what I'm there for. 
Do you see that? Do you see this text is all of a sudden it's going ushered into the presence of God and saying, I want to see God. I want to experience the depths of who he is. Give me a sense of how amazing he is, how in control he is. This world, he's not bothered by it. He is, his heart rate doesn't change because there's a Republican debate coming up this week, which is either a Republican debate or it's an early Saturday Night Live skit. I'm not sure which that's going to be because they're starting to blend nowadays, politics and SNL, back when SNL was funny. Because they're not funny anymore, but they used to be. And we're like, life is just this way. It's not that way with him. God's fine. He's like, oh, I've got this. Like, you have no idea how much I've got this. This experiencing of God. Look at the setup of this passage. Before we read verse 5, there is the triple, the repetition of the word holy. There's the shaking of the scene, not by God's presence, but by the fiery ones. Their yelling has produced the shaking. There's smoke. There's other threes in here. I don't know if you've noticed that. Sit with it long enough, you probably would see it. Um, you have, uh, well, with two wings, they cover their face, and, and then with two, their feet, and then with two sets, they, it's three wings, faces, and feet. But what's also interesting, if you look at verse 1, it says, the train of his robe filled the temple. The end of three, the whole earth is full of his glory. And then the end of verse four, we have another which closes it out. The temple was filled with smoke. I mean, it's, this scene is set. This scene is crafted. What's the response to experiencing the otherness and the holiness of God? Verse five, woe is me for I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He's watching this, and he is completely undone. He's ruined. I'm undone. I, I don't deserve to be here. I shouldn't be seeing any of this. He is so broken down by seeing how fantastic God is. Woe is me. Not only am I this way, I'm a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. We so don't deserve you. You are so spectacular. This is the first response to our experiencing how great God is, is to realize you don't deserve to be there. You've earned none of this. You don't belong. There's Him in His majesty, in His holiness, in His otherness, and all the drama that goes with it, and then there's you. And all Isaiah can think to say is, I shouldn't be here. This is too fantastic. This is too much. Think for a second. When we leave, I'm going to keep paralleling this a church service. We leave a church service and we're critical. So we've been attending a great church in town. When I'm not somewhere, it's called Pure Heart. Um, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a place. But I'll find myself, I'll leave, and it's huge. It's a huge place. I'll leave, and it's amazing how I'll critique it. Well, that's a great indicator that I'm not experiencing the sensing of God. If I'm leaving critical... Because when we experience who God is, and we go, and it's up to you, we can't blame a stage for that. You and I can worship God and come into His presence with somebody playing a harmonica. It's not about the instrument. It's never been about the instruments. 
It's always about our hearts. The heart says we're desiring to together come into a worship of God and coming with the spirit of I'm here to experience and sense God. And you take a person that walks in and wants to experience God, they're going to. And it eliminates criticism and judgment. It eliminates pride. There's a phrase that I've been captivated by it for, for decades, uh, by Soren Kierkegaard. The more I pray, the more difficult it becomes to pray. Think about that. The more I pray, the more difficult it becomes to pray. We're dealing with the, the dichotomy of imminence and transcendence again. If you want to talk his imminence and your familiarity with God and his love and care for you on a daily basis, the more you pray, the more sweet it becomes. You want to talk about his transcendence, the more we pray and experience who he is, the better we see how other he is and how sinful I still am. It's both. I want both. I don't want to be the 110-year-old guy walking around the church that he's so comfortable in his... I don't want to plateau. I don't want to ever plateau. I want to keep achieving and growing in my depths of my understanding of who God is. And as I sense Him, He reveals more sin in my life. The layers of an onion. I thought I was doing pretty good. He goes, yeah, you are. Yes, you're good. You're on target. But we do have some areas to deal with. Well, how do I deal with this? Should I read another book? No, you can read a book about it if you want. But if you really want to get rid of sin, he says, come over to me. Get close. Because the more we experience God, the more sin is eliminated. Then verse 6 starts with a then, because he doesn't leave us there. We want to experience God. And then he reveals to us all of our sin. And now we feel horrible. We're like, no, I don't deserve this. I'm going to go home and eat a bowl of worms. That's all I deserve are worms. Old worms. Off the sidewalk. Now, he doesn't leave us there. It's keep going. Do you see how this is? I want to experience who he is. That's it. That's like the flow. That's the impetus. That's what's going to create in me the brokenness of pride and sin and cynicism and criticism and judgment. It's going to take all of that away. Now I'm broken down. No, we're not done. Take a look at the next verse. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Again, the liveliness of this. I spent probably too much time figuring out why tongs. Why? It's a fiery one. I would think he could handle a hot coal. But the fiery one didn't go to the throne. He says, got it from the altar, not the throne. The altar is the place of forgiveness and cleansing. And he went and took a hot coal from the altar with tongs. It's trying to show the vividness and how real this is. And with this hot coal, touched his lips and said, now you're free. You and I have absolutely no access to God at all except through faith in Jesus Christ, his altar. That's it. We've earned nothing. We deserve nothing. He's provided for us the atonement, the washing away, the payment of all of our sin. He's provided all of that through the application of the altar. That's it. Well, that's why we celebrate that on Sunday. Been asked many times, how often is the gospel spoken on a Sunday morning? I'm like, oh, the gospel is who we are. It's every Sunday. 
The Gospels is alive and relevant today as it's ever been because it's where our atonement comes from. We get broken down in this recognition of sin in our life, and it's only through the application of the altar that we have forgiveness of sin and cleansing. To experience the wonderful freedom and refreshment of God's forgiveness. Our kids, youngest being 20 and the oldest being 25, um, we early on, they were pretty young, we early on started taking them places. We found out that our oldest was losing his sight. It started at about age seven and knew it was going to be progressive and legally blind in junior high. And then and so we thought, okay, this is one thing we can do. What do you want to see? If you want to see it, we're going to let you see it. So, so we did. We traveled so much. If there's a machine of traveling with three kids, it's Sarah. We talked about the, the dressing the same. That was why. So the three would all dress the same. Sarah would have me dress in black so she could just kind of block me out. But the three kids, and then we would we'd travel. We've seen everything. Um, a lot of funny ones. Uh, I remember we were, in, um, we were in this hallway, very dark, shouldn't have been in there, uh, can barely breathe, down into the center of a pyramid in Egypt. And you, you crowded, and you get down into the center, and there's a guy with us that took Grant. Uh, there's a big hole, and you can look in and see stuff. And he went, he was so nice, he took Grant and grabbed him and held him up so he could look in there. And his wife goes, honey, Dave, he can't see. And Grant goes, oh no, it's okay, this is interesting. He has no idea because he can't see it. So we, one thing he wanted to do, we thought would be great, was we whitewatered the Grand Canyon, the Colorado River, from start to finish. It's a week long, seven days. And it was, uh, this trip was just me, and it was Grant, and there's this area of Deer Creek flows through in the western part of the Grand Canyon, and has about a 150-foot drop into this pool of water that then goes into the Colorado. You can only see it if you're on the river in the Grand Canyon. No other way to get to it. And Grant and I thought that was great. A lot of people hiked to the very top. I saw that there was Diet Coke, so I stayed. And so Grant and I took uh, chairs, and we sat them into the pool of water with the waterfall behind us. And we each, he had like a, um, a grape crush, and I had my Diet Coke, and we sat in freezing cold, freezing cold. We're sitting there in the mist, and it was so refreshing. And then we're sitting there, and we said, okay, let's see who can get closest. So he'd scoot back a little bit, and I'll scoot back a little bit, and now it's starting to hurt. We're still a ways away from it, and we keep moving and keep moving. And then he just went ahead and scooted way in, and he won. I let him win that one. We giggled like girls for the longest time. It was so overwhelming and refreshing. Like, we still to this day, whenever... We're like, you remember, oh, Grant, the Diet Coke in freezing cold, fresh water. God's grace is that. God's kindness and forgiveness to you is an overwhelming amount of cold, refreshing, cleansing your past, whatever it has been, and your past might have been last week. It might have been last night. God's grace and His kindness, His non-judgment of you, He loves you so much just the way you are right now. Don't clean up. Don't clean up first. Just back into it. Back into it until you just can't handle it anymore. It is so wonderful. It's so refreshing. It's so freeing. That's Christianity. 
And when we experience that, then we turn to a community and we offer them the same thing. The most non-judgmental people in the world should be people that have experienced forgiveness and love and grace of God. We should be the least judgmental. And the truth is, a conservative Christian, which is what we are, we are some of the most judgmental people in the world today. That is hugely disgraceful to the grace of God. Well, but we stand for, yeah, I know, I know the explanation. Yeah, but they're ruining. No, what's ruining the nation today is the inactivity of the church in leading people to Christ and sharing this grace that we experience from the waterfall, the refreshment. It isn't just for us. It's for us to experience and then to give out to a world. And we're not giving it out. We stand back and we judge and we point fingers and say, this group's ruining America. No, the one that's ruining America is the inactivity of the church. We sit back with the platitudes of the rules and this is how things really should be. No, I know what it says. How do you do it? No, how do you do it? The standard of morality that we hold so high, how do you do it? Through the grace of God only. So we are going to point to a world and have them live up to a morality that the Bible speaks to without the overwhelming grace of God. It's impossible. It's impossible. And it's why we don't live it very well either. Why is the divorce rate in the church very similar to the divorce rate in the world today? And you know it is, right? It's close to 50% on both. Where's the otherness? Where's the set apart? Well, then we just need to preach marriage better. No, that's not it. That's not it. You and I do not have the ability to live that high moral life that we are demanding on everybody else. We can't do it. God does it through us. It's as we experience the depths and beauty of His grace and kindness and forgiveness, as we experience all of that, we allow it to clean us and then flow through us into a lost world. But somehow, we take all of that, we bottle it up, and then we just put the rules on everybody else. This is fun. You're looking down going, surely he's done. <laughs> because I cannot wait to put a no vote down on this guy. This is, you're like, I can't figure out his politics yet. I'm, I think I know, but I'm not. He made fun of the Republican. Out of all the Republicans in the world, in America, really those are the best we can come up with? That's amazing to me. There's some good ones there. There are some good ones. Real quick is the last one. It's another then, verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, and this is so fun. He's not saying it to Isaiah. This is the first time the Lord has spoken from the throne, by the way. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Now you're getting closer to the Trinity, by the way. Us could be for us, meaning he's speaking and he's speaking for the seraphs, for all of us. Possible. That would fit. But this is probably closer to the Genesis text. We'll create man in our image. This is probably closer to that. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. This is so great. This is where service comes from. This is why we serve God and why we sign up to volunteer and why we put in long hours, not out of felt obligation, although we do that too. We, right? All the other reasons. 
We experience who God is, and we're overwhelmed by His greatness. He's broken down the sin in our life, and then He brings us that grace and forgiveness from the altar, and now we're like, okay, put me in, coach. I'm in. You name the place, I'm going. I want to be in. Use me any way you want. That is the greatest choir member, greeter, nursery worker, is the one that has experienced the depths of who God is and lives in that presence of who God is, has a brokenness of pride and a humility about themselves and a cleansing that came only from the altar. This isn't a person who's going to be judgmental on anybody because they know I don't deserve any of this. And they say, I want to work in the nursery. Oh, that's who I want holding my kid's baby or my kid. I want that person. The greeting that we get greeted so fantastic here, there's a, there's a real heart desire to greet. It's not like a job. It's the they know who God is. They've experienced the depths of forgiveness, and now they get to serve. And then it doesn't matter where we serve. We just want to serve. Okay, it is. It's 11.30, huh? Okay. There's a famous story. I'll end with this. There's a famous story. Um, it's published, actually, by, um, which is a bit surprising to me. Uh, it's published by uh, Bill Moyers. Bill Moyers was a PBS guy. It's published in an interview he did with a guy named Jacob Needleman. So this, was, this is still in print, and it's the two of them talking. Jacob Needleman was a journalist. He's also a bit of a philosopher. He's very bright. I think he just died, actually, uh, maybe two years ago, secular. And he recounts this story. In July 15, 1975, it was an Apollo mission he recounted how they're a distance away from the rocket launch site and there were some refreshments laid out and it was just a bunch of journalists in the room. And Needleman's cool. He's, he's like, yeah, and there's, there's not a more cynical group of people than you get a bunch of journalists together in a room. We're all making fun of each other. And he goes, we're just, we have this cold callousness about ourselves because we're dealing with the underbelly of society every day. This day was special. This is the launch of this rocket that's 36 stories tall. It's, it almost dwarfs the Statue of Liberty. There's pictures you could put online where they kind of put them together as if they're right next to each other. And you have this little lady, Liberty, and then you have this massive rocket. And they're all just sitting there chatting and they're talking and all of a sudden there's that kind of familiar countdown that they're all so used to. And all of a sudden there is this launch. At the time it's the largest, most powerful rocket ever launched over a million pounds of thrust. They were blinded by the light. And then because sound travels later, all of a sudden the place just shook. And then it was gone. He recounted that in that room, there was a deafening silence. They all just stood there. All criticism was gone. There wasn't a thought of judgment or cynicism on anything in that room because they just saw the most spectacular thing they have ever... They couldn't even imagine what they were going to see. And when we come before God, and whether it's corporately on a Sunday or it's individually as you open your Bible in the morning, we are coming before the Creator of the universe. The holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And we just were like, I don't deserve to be here. Needleman said, it didn't last long. He goes, we were hugging each other. 
He goes, the mood in that area was so funny to look back on because of what they saw. And when you and I experience on a regular basis the majesty and the otherness of who God is, it burns away everything. That's why you can have such a different array of backgrounds in a room. We get political parties galore, and we can make fun of all of them. It just doesn't matter because we all love each other. We are all together because of our allegiance to the holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And when we lose that, when we lose that, everything sets in. I like this. I don't like this. The division starts. This is true of your own family. You want unity in your family? Raise your kids in the fear of the Lord. Because there's that central piece. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, you do not have access to the Father. You're in your sin. There, there is a separation that cannot be overcome except from the altar that is applied to your life, faith in Jesus Christ makes us alive in our relationship with Him and cleansed. But that's not the ending. Then as we regularly go to Him, experiencing the refreshment of grace cleanses us continually. Then it flows through us and we have that same acceptance and love and grace and forgiveness that we offer to everybody we come in contact with. Oh, to experience God like Isaiah 6. Pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we've experienced you today. It's people participating in the service that love you very much, desire to make you known. And Heavenly Father, as we contemplate Isaiah 6 in our lives, I pray that each day we live in an experience of you. In Jesus' name, amen.